Welcome to the Science Podcast for January 4th, 2019. I'm Megan Cantwell. On this week's show, I talk with contributing correspondent, Tanya Ravistratatana, about Plan S, an initiative for publishing open access research. What's holding back other research funders from joining? I also speak with Louis Stone about his quantitative approach to understanding one of the most deadly periods of the Holocaust. In September of 2018, Science Europe announced an initiative called Plan S. The plan requires that researchers who use funding from any institution signed onto the initiative to publish their work in an open access repository or journal that's available to everyone by 2020. I'm with Tanya Rabesandratana to talk about how research funders and countries have been receiving this plan. Hey, Tanya. Hi, Megan. So what institutions have currently joined this plan? Right now, we have 16 institutions uh, from 13 different countries that have joined the Coalition S, as it's called. Mm -hmm. And that includes uh, one private funder from the US, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and some uh, major funding agencies from France and the United Kingdom, and also smaller agencies from other countries. You mentioned before that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation signed on to Plan S, and they also previously did require open access as a mandate to using their funding. So what is the difference between what the Gates Foundation used to mandate and how does it change that they've joined Plan S? The Gates Foundation was definitely a pioneer. They, they've they already been requiring immediate open access uh, since 2017. Mm-hmm. But Plan S goes even further because it also targets hybrid journals. Hybrid journals are journals that make money both from subscription and from article processing charges. So that's what is called double dipping. And Planner says, we don't want double dipping. We want hybrid journals to shift their business model to complete open access. And they require written commitments to do so within a certain amount of time. Uh, The Gates Foundation, they didn't target hybrid journals at the time. And now they're aligning with planners and they are saying they will crack down on, on hybrid journal publication too. Has there been a lot of interest in other research funders joining Plan S? There have been statements of support. At the time of the plan was launched in particular, there were several letters that accompanied the plan and the list of uh, of funders. So agencies did say, we support the goals of Plan S, uh, but we're not quite ready to join for this or that reason. So what are the main reservations for funders who haven't signed on yet? Plan S is, uh, is quite radical. Most funders already have open access policies. They're already required to Clear that the grantees uh, make their scientific papers available for free, but they generally allow six month or 12 month delay. And Planners requires immediate open access. So it goes much further. And it also has a very short timeline to begin action on the 1st of January 2020. So for a lot of funders, this goes a bit too far, too fast. Some funders would prefer to take less radical action. And they want the research community to kind of shape their open access transformation from the bottom up rather than imposing top-down rules. It's not just research funders who are involved in Plan S. It, of course, also impacts researchers as well. What has been the general reception by scientists to this initiative? So the reception by scientists was really mixed. The vast majority of of scientists aren't aware, I think, of of Plan S. It's fair to say that so far it's a it's a policy plan that hasn't yet been implemented. So they don't see the difference in their grant contracts and the obligation that have changed for them. But for open access advocates who followed these very closely, they have been very strong reactions, sometimes very emotional reactions. Some people think uh, funder mandates the way to go. If the institution that has the money decides to mandate this, then it will definitely happen. And others think it's too radical, it's too far, too soon, too restrictive, and they would like more options to publish in different venues, or they would need more time, or they would want more more detail to know exactly what we have been. Yeah, and on the other side, there are the publishers of this research. What has been their concerns? Not all of them have responded. I think a lot of them are taking the time to see exactly what's going to be the very, very fine print of Plan S. Some publishers have said they will work with the planners funders and to find a solution that works for them and to adapt and, and continue to have a business model that works for them. And others are kind of waiting and we don't yet know if they're going to be cooperative. Is the big question is, are the other publishers going to play ball or not? Are they going to wait until the very last minute? 
although open access publication mean, means it's free on the user end to access, there's a fee associated with publishing the paper, though. Is this something that Plan S discusses? Open access doesn't always involve a fee. I think that's a very important point to, to take on board. Um, there are ways to publish open access without fees. Plan S does focus, and some critics at the beginning thought there was too much focus on this gold business model when researchers pay a fee to a journal to have their paper published open access. And Plan S says funders that sign on to Plan S will pick up the bill for these article processing charges and we will cap them. They want to make sure that article processing charges are not going to skyrocket um, and that the market is a little bit more even and fair. One important thing to keep in mind is that not every region has the same publishing practices. Some publishers are saying that they're not going to buy in until all funders join in on this. And based on your research, does it seem likely that there's going to be a lot more people joining Plan S in the coming months? So based on our research, uh, yes, we know that some agencies are planning to join. Some of them need more time. It's kind of a big geopolitical game. There might be some peer pressure for funders to say, okay, this group of funders is, is opening the door to something really radical. We also want in. Or on the contrary, they might say, oh, I just, I'd rather wait and see what happens with this group of people before I commit myself. At the time that Planets was launched, there were, there were 11 funders. Now it's already grown and it's been four months. It's already been five more uh, agencies have joined. And then in December, China said they support the goals of Plan S. Without saying that they will formally join the coalition, they say we completely support the goals of Plan S and mention very similar measures to Plan S. So that weight of a good number of agencies from Europe, a very clear commitment from China is definitely significant. It's not an isolated project. It's, it's taken a, a global flavor. Even if these countries don't join Plan S by saying that they are also committed to open access, that could also still have a sway on publishers then. If they align their policies to the basic principles of Plan S uh, without signing formally, it's less powerful, obviously, because the alignment will be possibly less strong. But if they go for similar measures, then it can definitely have a very big impact. We're still a little ways away from the 2020 deadline. Are there still some aspects of Plan S that may change in the upcoming year? The basic principles of Plan S are not going to change. They're a very short set of 10 brief principles, and the team behind Plan S has made it clear that they will not open those for discussions. But the implementation guidelines that have been released in November are open for feedback until the end of the month. So looking forward on how this might impact research culture in the future, some people contend that publishing in a journal with a high impact factor has an influence on hiring decisions. How would Plan S change this? Plan S says uh, that they support the San Francisco Declaration Research Assessment, which says that uh, research needs to be assessed on its own merits and not on the basis of which journal it was published in. Mm -hmm. So they say the funders who sign on to Plan S intend to sign the San Francisco Declaration and to implement their related policies for research assessment. This is not a binding requirement. So it's a little bit fuzzy how the change will happen. Obviously, if you change the publishing culture, you don't only change the place where a paper is published. This has an impact on the whole publishing system. So the way that you typically decide who to give money to for a research proposal or who to recruit, who to promote, all these things are tied with journals and especially the journal impact factor. The people behind Plan is hope that by changing the publishing culture, you will change the research culture more broadly. Gotcha. All right. Thanks so much, Tanya. Thank you. Tanya Rabasandratana is a contributing correspondent at Science. You can find a link to her story at sciencemag.org slash podcasts. Stay tuned for my interview with Louis Stone about quantifying the kill rate during the Holocaust. I'm here with Louis Stone to talk about his research being published in Science Advances, which quantifies how fast the Nazi genocide occurred during a particularly deadly period of the Holocaust. Hey, Louis. Hi there, Megan. First off, I'm curious what your background is and how you arrived at this topic that's at the intersection of both math and history. Sure. I work in uh, mathematical biology, and a lot of my work deals with modeling diseases and epidemiology. A few years ago, I got interested in the spread of disease during the Holocaust because uh, disease played a large role. As it happened, I came across an incredible data set that 
outlying disease in the Warsaw Ghetto, where there was a huge typhus epidemic. It's uh, a case that's not very known about. And so I've been studying this data quite a bit. While doing this, I came across other documents and other data sets, and that led me to my larger work on the Holocaust. Your research centers specifically around Operation Reinhardt, and that was one of the largest murder campaigns of the Holocaust. Could you give some background about this event? In January 1942, arguably, it was the one conference when the Nazis finalized on the final solution to eradicate all the Jewish population. And they began with Operation Reinhardt, which was all the uh, Jews in occupied Poland, and there were close to two million of them, and they were to be obliterated within a year. The Operation Reinhardt itself took 21 months. In terms of the procedure, the Nazis built three death camps, Treblinka, Belzec, and Sobibor. And the idea was to round up all the Jews from all the communities in occupied Poland to train them in large train loads to these three different camps, and then to gas them and to kill them. And that they did within hours of arrival at the facilities. This operation occurred during just one period of the Holocaust. How were you able to evaluate this specific event? That's the crux of the issue. In fact, this specific event has been overlooked for a decade. A lot of concentration was put on Auschwitz in the years after. The difference being that Auschwitz, there were survivors. Mm -hmm. And so there was data and diaries and accounts that were much more easily accessible. What happened in Operation Reinhardt, though, was meant to be a total secret. The Nazis destroyed all data and there was a 99.7% kill rate. Anyone who went into any of those three death camps didn't come out. Every five years, I look for material on this. And then I, I found this book by a famous Holocaust historian, Yitzhak Arad. He wrote a book on Operation Reinhardt. Mm -hmm. At the back of the book, there's this appendix with all the train transportations listed in occupied Poland, giving the location, the date, the number of victims, and the destination at which this Jewish community would be transported to, meaning which death camp. Mm -hmm. So we know the times they were transported, we know the places from which they were transported from, and we have a good estimate of the numbers. So what did you learn about the time frame and the rate of murder during this operation from those railway transport records? Well, I have to tell you, at first, I was very reluctant to input the data because these are people's lives yeah. and you really feel it. We put the data in, Rory and I, and we saw the time series. And then I got quite a shock because what you see is over 21 months, you see a low level killing rate, relatively. I mean, there's still a lot of killing. But then in the months of August, September, October, there was half a million, 500,000 people each month murdered. That's like 15,000 people per day. Now, what would happen at, say, a facility like Treblinka, mm -hmm. you could have two trains in a day, which is like 10,000 people in a day, and they would be murdered within hours upon arrival. It's really vast. This is a scale of murder that you wouldn't think possible, mm -hmm. and it requires large-scale organised support to enable it. It was a pure focused genocide in which the Jewish population just didn't have a chance. Why is it that this particular event happened so fast? I think this was the uh, most organized operation. Mm -hmm. It really set out to target a large area, collect all the Jews in that area and kill them, murder them within three months. I mean, it was, like I said, a focused genocide deliberately designed to do that. It's the largest and fastest scale genocide that I know of. What caused the end of this intense kill rate? So after three months, there were very few uh, victims left in occupied Poland to collect. So the Germans had basically finished their job. So when you look at the graph, the killings just suddenly stop. And that's an indication that they've run out of Jewish people to kill. Yeah. There's also another implication. Because it lasted three months, not only is it not widely known, you can do a search in books on the internet. You won't see it. They won't give you any time frame. It happened over 21 months or it may have happened right. over six years. This is the first time, I believe, that it's really isolated down to the bulk of the killing happened in three months. So if you think about it, how is the victim supposed to come up with any organised resistance? It would be impossible. I mean, the event was over before it almost began. Do you think this will change how historians characterise the Holocaust? 
it will definitely add to the interpretation of a very large part of it, which is not widely known. I show these graphs to people all the time and they're quite shocked. No one realizes that that's how a genocide could work. They always see it in other terms. Like you hear six million Jewish people died in the Holocaust, but your mind cannot latch on to that huge number. It's, you can't grasp it. But you look at these graphs and you really catch what happens. Yeah, and you mentioned in your research that textbooks often compare other genocides to the Holocaust, like the Rwandan genocide. And some textbooks say that this genocide had kill rates that were three to five times higher than the Holocaust. And your research suggests otherwise. So what do you think the importance of this research is in contextualizing other genocides? There is a big field of comparative genocide. It's now become standard that, yes, the Rwanda genocide was the uh, most intense genocide of the 20th century, all genocides in 20th century considered, including the Holocaust. So, for example, Samantha Power, the ex-US ambassador to the UN, stated that the Rwanda genocide was the fastest, most efficient killing spree of the 20th century. And many, many other comparative genocide scholars tell us the same. Well, they just don't know about Operation Reinhardt, and it could be because that information's not out there. So I'm hoping my study will rectify that. But it's a whole field of comparative genocide studies. If you use their estimates to work out what the rate of the Holocaust was, they underestimate it by a factor of 10, and the uh, Holocaust was at least double the rate of the Rwanda genocide. What does it tell us about comparative genocide studies? It tells us to be very careful when you go and do these comparisons and preferably don't do them because it's not helpful and usually there isn't data available to do it well. And why do you think it is important to take this quantitative approach to characterizing genocides? There's now a whole new science of quantifying wars, conflicts and genocides. So if you look at modern genocides, there's great efforts now being made to characterize the war casualties and the different types of war casualties, whether they're civilian or not. So there's huge efforts put into it so that we don't get it wrong again and that we really know what happens. Because like I said, going back to the Holocaust, there isn't much data available. That makes it so hard when future generations really want to understand what goes on they'll get stuck. You know, there's not any modern statistics. And believe it or not, there's not even one graph. You won't find graphs of it. And this is such a data-hungry age. It's changing that way faster and faster. So quantifying is very important because it becomes more tangible evidence. There are attempts to quantify it, but they don't, they don't have data. So it's, it's a real uh, problem. All right. Thank you so much, Louis. Thank you. Louis Stone is a professor of biomathematics at Tel Aviv University in Israel and of Mathematical Sciences at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. You can find a link to his paper, published in Science Advances, at sciencemag.org slash podcasts. And that concludes this edition of the Science Podcast. If you have any comments or suggestions for the show, write to us at sciencepodcast at aaas.org. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts, or you can listen on the science website. That's sciencemag.org slash podcasts. To place an ad on the science podcast, contact midroll.com. This show was produced by Megan Cantwell and Sarah Crespi and edited by Podigy. Jeffrey Cook composed the music. On behalf of Science Magazine and its publisher, AAAS, thanks for joining us.